Welcome back to This Day Live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. With me, I have Professor David Awurawo, Professor of International Relations and Strategic Studies at the University of Lagos, and Dr. Nameka Ubiariri, an investment banking executive. Gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, joining me. We've had two guests, uh, Captain Umar Adliyu Babangida, commenting on the killing of 16 military personnel in uh, Delta State, and also Mr. Dan Kunle, who was commenting on the proposed probe of the Ajakuta Steel uh, Company. Quickly, let me start with you, Professor Awurawo. Um, the violence uh, in Okuama, in Okolobo, in uh, Delta State, Delta South, and then stretching to Bomadi, is very disturbing and uh, is unfortunate. Incidentally, it's an area I'm fairly familiar with. I lived in Wari for some time, and all those areas, Bomadi, Okwara Waterside, and all of that, the riverine part, and then the upland, where you have, you know, um, Ugeli, Agbara, Agbaro, and the rest of them. These were ordinarily very peaceful communities for a long, long time, uh, which is why what we are hearing from there is very, very disturbing, very peaceful, you know, uh, riverine communities. And it raises a whole lot of questions. Ordinarily, it was just a communal, you know, uh, disagreement between Kuama and Okolobo, um, which one would have expected that would not warrant this kind of violence. And when one remembers uh, the number of military men killed and the caliber, it becomes even more disturbing because it, it, it means that um, small arms and light weapons are there in very large numbers which also means that, you know, they have sophisticated weapons. You know what it takes to be able to engage military men of that caliber and kill 16 of them? It tests the level of, you know, um, weapons in the place. And of course, the capacity of the people to, able to use those weapons, you know, to, to, to kill. So, I mean, any uh, right-thinking person will condemn it vehemently. And just as others have said, uh, there must be thorough investigation. Those who have done this must be brought to justice. They shouldn't do this and then just get away with it. Rule of law must prevail in this matter. And now talking about rule of law broadly, uh, once you also add quickly that they had been killing in that place. The Okoma people said three of their members were killed and then they abducted, you know, uh, somebody, uh, you know, one Mr. Abo. And then the military were now invited to come and try and free the abducted man. Uh, apparently, the Okwan people thought that the military were coming to support the other community from the, from the comments they have made. And they decided to engage the military instead of seeing the military as, you know, uh, mediate those who have come to make peace in the place. So there needs to be thorough investigation. There needs to be punishment for those who have carried out this act. Murder has punishment and the law should take its course in this regard. But there also need to be reassurance because apparently mistrust is also part of why things have come to this level. Um, because apart from even the military, the Okokoran people have also have, you know, accused the Theta State government of supporting the other community against them. So they, they seem to perceive the entire you know, political authority to be against them. So there needs to be some reassurance along that line, why the law takes its course. But we're also hearing that the place has been set ablaze. Uh, purportedly by military men. That also is, it has to be condemned. Um, because these people took law, in, law into their hands. If we say now that they must fish out those who carried out this killing and they must be punished, what about those who also carried out this uh, arson? Should they also not be fished out and punished? And that's why I want to conclude on this matter. Uh, all too often it happens that when there is violence against the military authority, any group of military men, you always see this reprisal. There needs to be some measure of um, restraint. Um, we remember uh, Fela's mother, for instance, uh, the military men went to throw her from, throw away, throw down uh, um, an old room from two story building. And up to today, they are unknown soldiers. Anytime they, there's reprisal like that, nobody's ever brought to justice. There has to be justice on all sides, and there has to be reassurance. Something quickly has to be you know, done to ensure that calm is restored in that place. But it is condemnable, and uh, Nigerians need to know that violence hardly achieves anything positive. 
There needs to be audio, or a reorientation of Nigerians to come to realize this. Because all of a sudden, last week we were discussing about the kidnap of so many. After we spoke, there were still more, more kidnaps. Nigeria is, uh, you know, quickly becoming a Hobbesian state of nature, where the life of man is becoming solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. There needs to be this, this, this consciousness that violence hardly achieves anything positive. Uh, when there are disagreements, there is the authority to, you know, go to that will help resolve it and not taking laws into one's hands. Then for Mr. Dankule's uh, submission, uh, I'm enamored by his uh, erudition and his knowledge of, you know, uh, the economy, global economy and Nigerian economy. I wonder why men like this are not uh, consulted by government. His knowledge is just vast, it's encyclopedic, touching, you know, virtually all aspects of the economy. But to focus on the narrow issue that, you know, uh, it was brought into the school, which is the Ajakuta State Complex. Once again, this is, a, you know, it reveals how badly Nigeria has been managed. I spoke about $20 billion uh, loss. I think it should be up to that, if not more. Um, and the way the whole thing has passed on from one government to the other, one group of uh, persons to the other until now, is actually a shame. Uh, under the Abacha government, there was this buyback or no buyback, and when the uh, uh, Basenjo government came, that was, you know, a, a reversal took place, some other measures were taken, and it has been this flip flop, flip flop thing now. And like he said, it's not limited to only Ajakuta. You can go on and on. Itakwe, uh, Jebba Paper Miss, uh, uh, Delta Glass, you can name it, uh, Boku. You can go on and on and on, and it's the same story of mismanagement, corruption, and the rest of them. And it, it, it's, it simply explains why we are where we are. Uh, so backward, uh, always we have potential, always potential. But our potential has remained potential, not, not, not actualized. And we hope that, I support the pro, by the way. Uh, I support uh, Senator Dwara. Uh, I do not accept uh, those, the submission of those traditional knowledge. They don't know what they are talking about. Uh, they, what, how much knowledge of how these things uh, you know, play out do they, do they have? There should be a thorough probe. Let us find out how, how we are where we are and what we can do moving forward to be able to get that place running. And others like it. Um, it, 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 it you know, it's at the heart of our development uh, policies and programs. Let us get to the root of you know, what has happened and the way forward. It's, it, is, it is of immense importance. Um, when all of this is done, hopefully, uh, you know, uh, all Nigerians will be the better for it. Dr. Obiareri. Um, Dr. Abati, it's um, heartbreaking and uh, what happened in Delta State. You know, we've gotten to such a state where everywhere had become so lawless. Two army majors, a lieutenant colonel, a captain and 12 others, heart-wrenching. And that's also, we have to look at how we can improve on our security and the domestic justice administrative system. Ordinarily, what would have expected the police and uh, the DSS to be the ones responsible for trying to provide this kind of peaceful settlement of community disputes. And we don't know why we've involved the army in everything that had to do from communal dispute resolution, rescue of kidnappers, uh, kidnapped victims and all the rest of it. It's, it's good for us to strengthen the police, strengthen the institutions of the state and make them to do their work. The military had been so overstretched and they, it's not right every time we are losing our gallant military men. Nigeria is not at war from an external aggressor. And I think the government of the day must probe to get to the root of this matter. Everyone who is culpable must be brought to book. And again, the issue of reprisal, we need to retrain our military men to understand that you do not achieve military, you do not procure intelligence and the confidence of the people when you go on. I'm sure there are many innocent people who have lost their houses, lost their means of livelihood because of the activities of some hoodlums, some bandits and some terrorists who perpetrated this act. Both actions are condemnable and should not be allowed to repeat itself again. And then on the issue of Ajokuta still, I know it's another thing that explains why we are where we are today. An industrial complex that was built to help drive industrialization of Nigeria over how many decades now? We've not yet found resolutions to that challenge. And I also want to believe that the senior probe is very altruistic, that they are not probing from the place of selfishness, they are probing with the intent of finding lasting solution on how we can revamp and uh, transform that place to serve the purpose for which it was established. Interestingly, most of these 
industrial complex. We are built under the military. We, if we look back over the last 24 years, one cannot pinpoint to any tangible thing that has been done in terms of infrastructure over the last 24 years. Most of the achievement that we had was of under Obasanjo, from the GSM revolution um, to some of the institutional transformation that we have. Since 2007, I cannot point out to anything. Even the petrochemical plant and refineries that we have built, we have built in 13 years under the military regime. It was the military that built it, from Yakubu Gowon to, to uh, Lushegun Obasanjo, to Babangida, those refineries were built in 13 years, but 24 years, we can't even repair them. Talk less of putting them to work. Now they promised us that they will come on stream in March. We just pray that they come on stream in March, and again that they also, but for us to make this country work, we need to look at how we can strengthen things. We need to privatize those refineries and petrochemical plants. Obasanjo understood the importance of privatizing them. In 2007, when he handed over to the Blue Star Consortium, led by Aliko Dangote, Femi Otodla, and the rest of them, if that exercise was not reversed under Yadwa, by now we would not have been where we are today. We need to put the Wari refinery, the Potako refinery in a bucket and allow the NMPC to sell down 80% of their shareholding to deep pocketed private investors. I would even prefer there are many downstream local operators that can easily revive that place, reform it, and we will start producing. And I even want to suggest, even on the upstream, we also, this NNPC need to divest wholly. Federal government need to divest 60% of their shareholding in NNPC Limited. Look at NNPC. Asset size, $58 billion. Over how many years? Look at Petrobras. Petrobras today is only owned 28.6% by the Brazilian government. The rest are private investors and other shareholders. Petrobras was founded in 1970. Petrobras last year had a turnover of 126 billion. That was their 124 billion. That was their revenue in dollars. Their profit was 37 billion dollars. Their total asset base is 174 billion dollars. Petrobras does about 2.3 million barrels, including all your assets. And if we can do this, and which is the most important step to take, federal government of Nigeria, please, we, we want to plead and beg them. And we know that the oil and gas assets, uh, our resources, are very important for their political arrangements. But they should look at how, for the interest and overall interest of Nigerians, as a matter of emergency, sell down 60%. That will unlock about $38 billion into the federation account. And I will, I'll bet you, in, over the next five years, we'll have nothing less than $100 billion investment into that sector. Well, let's take another topic, and this has to do with student loans. Nigeria has postponed the launch of the Nigerian Student Loan Scheme. The Executive Secretary of the Nigerian Education Loan Fund, Akintunde Soya, disclosed this on Tuesday. President Bola Tinubu had in June 2023 signed a bill to start a student loan fund that will give interest-free loans to Nigerians for higher education. A former speaker, of the House of Representatives, Femi Bajabiamila, proposed the bill, and the scheme was supposed to start by October 2023. President Tinubu had said the program will begin in January 2024, following the lapse of the October deadline. Now, we're told that this student's loan fund, uh, brought into being by the Access to Higher Education Act, will be launched in January. From January, they moved it to February. From February to March. And now, last Thursday, last Wednesday, we were told now it's been postponed again. Some reports were saying the postponement is uh, indefinite, uh, but there's been some cl clarification by uh, the managers of the fund saying that, look, maybe two weeks, maybe at best one month, just to, you know, fine tune the details before the student's loan is brought you know, uh, to the public. Uh, but what do you think? Some students are saying they don't, they don't even believe that the uh, government is serious about the loan. Why is it being postponed again and again? Shouldn't they have worked out the details before announcing it to Nigerians? Let me start with you, Dr. Biareri. I know it, it, it's, it's so painful that uh, we, in this part of the world, Nigeria, we have not placed so much emphasis on education. And it's even heartbreaking that we're talking about 15 billion naira only for over 6 million of our children in tertiary institution, not as grant, but as loan. This is a country that budgeted 15 billion naira for library and books for 469 members of the National Assembly. 
This is a country that budgeted six billion naira for car parks, yet we are struggling to provide just paltry 50, um, 15 billion naira. 50. It's 50. 50 billion 50 naira. Billion. Even 50 billion is nothing. I, I, I want us to look back. You know, we talk about um, Engineer Kunle says something very striking. If you go back to 1965, I was looking at the development of Singapore, development of South Korea, and even China. As of 1965, Nigeria had GDP per capita that is better than that of Singapore, that of South Korea, even that of China. As at that time, literacy level in um, South Korea was 57%. Literacy level in China was 60%. Nigeria was the same level with them. These countries, what did they do? They pursued education. They understood the importance of knowledge. The Chinese started revolutionized it. It's Singaporeans. By 2005, literacy level in China was 98%. That of Singapore, 98%. And if you look at it, Singapore today is a first world country. Education was very, very key. I, it bothers me that a country that has 20 million kids out of school, a country that has an education system that have lost so much in quality, cannot budget 25 to 40% of our expenditures every year on education and the health, social investment. Abia State and Delta State, I think Enugu State, and some of the states have seen their budget, we actually budgeted 20%, 25% of total education. Look at South Africa. Out of a budget of $125 billion for the 2024, South Africa budgeted $25.8 billion at the federal level for the education sector. And South African universities are among the top 10 in the whole of Africa. No Nigerian university ranks among that top 10. Yet, despite the fact that they are far ahead of us, they still budgeted 20% of their national budget on education. I think we need to prioritize this. It is heartbreaking. It is heart-wrenching. Education, there was a time in Nigeria, in the early 60s, people come from all over the world to University of Ibadan, to Ife, to University of Nigeria, Asuka, for quality education. Today, they are, most people have abandoned those public institutions because of the quality of education, because we are not funding education. I expect us to have at least a fund of nothing less than 500 billion naira for scholarships, for, for grants, for very highly intelligent Nigerians who cannot afford it. China moved most of their people. Some went to uh, MIT, some went to Harvard, some went to Cambridge. And in 25 years, through knowledge and education, they were able to move 700 million people out of poverty in a space of 20 years. In Nigeria, we've moved our poverty from 4 million in 1980 to today about 133 million. Because some of even the violence we have today, insecurity, is all down to lack of knowledge, all down to illiteracy. When you educate, educate a nation, you empower a nation. Most of our diasporans today are contributing massively. Look at the other way, Nigeria Medical and Dental Council trying to do all manner of shenanigans to restrict medical practitioners from traveling out of Nigeria. In a country where we think proactively, our greatest export is our human beings. What we should be doing is to see in every local government area, we should have a nursing and military free school that meets international standards. So that if we need one million of them and we produce two million, we will ship one million out, just like the Indians and Chinese are doing. They will go out there, acquire more knowledge, acquire more skills, bring in the India dollar into this economy. But we are not being scientific. And of course, this thing costs across the federal level, the state level, and local government level. We want to beg those. And Kunle said it here. The political infrastructure in Nigeria is so weak. Our greatest challenge in Nigeria is the will and patriotism of the politicians to do what is. And we want to plead with them. Some of us are tired of talking. We want to keep on begging. Do the right thing. Let this country work. Rough. Uh, you Student know, loans. You know, that's my constituency. <laughs> um, and I have for some uh, you know, information uh, regarding what uh, this postponement uh, has cost and is costing. Uh, you know, initially we said that, uh, you know, schools increased, I mean, they introduced uh, all sorts of levies. They didn't call them fees, but those who were paying 19,000 and paid about, paid about 140 to 200,000. Some couldn't, you know, resume, really. Uh, some who resumed uh, have dropped out. Some are still struggling. They know if they paid part, they will struggle to pay the other part when second semester comes. Things like that. You know, we have said that government needed to uh, put this loan uh, uh, in place before schools would commence uh, introduction of fees. Even though they didn't call them fees, but uh, there's no other name to use to you know describe them. Uh, but Again, we said the government put, I mean, the schools and the government put the cats before the horse. 
because the consequence will be that students will drop out, and many have actually indeed dropped out. At the other time, where one year, a student from my faculty I was written in the newspaper disappeared. They thought he was lost. <laughs> uh, he surfaced last week and said, ah, I went to hustle for money. I wanted to write my exam, and exams were around the corner. Uh, sorry for not giving information that, uh, of where I, my whereabouts. Um, it looked comical, but it, 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 that, that is just, that exemplifies what is happening in, in the system. So for government to continue to postpone this over and over again, is so disheartening. And you know, I've been saying this, you know, on this program, that uh, it seems so difficult for government to act when what is involved concerns the poor. And that is something that this government must work to overcome. Uh, because a government of activists is not supposed to be, to you know, leave the poor behind. Um, so it, it is disheartening, and if they say two weeks, they should put everything in order and launch this thing, let it begin, to, I mean, let, let, let it begin to, to work. And those details we pointed out before, because I don't know the framework now, uh, where some of the things that you know, are requested are things that those children will never get, children of the poor will never get that you're going to look for somebody who is uh, level 15, level 16 to sign and to indemnify. As the policy, I don't indemnify. Once you bring a form to me and it has indemnification. In fact, I had a, cause, a, a, a relation that was arrested and they brought something and said, I don't indemnify for anybody. It means that if the person is not found, you will be held liable. In fact, when the police, the policeman can say, do you know the meaning of this word indemnification? He laughed. That thing is in that was on the original one. The one that is to be launched now, I hope it is not there. Because if it is there, the students won't be able to access it. People will be reluctant to sign uh, so that when they retire, all their retirement benefits will be used to pay for somebody that may never be, that may not be found. Uh, you know? The thing should be liberalized in such a way that those terms are not there. So that, and of course, they should ensure that this thing comes on stream as quickly as possible so that our education can begin to you know, uh, move forward. Like uh, Dr. Barry said, we know that investment in education has the highest return. I was in Harvard the other time. You would think it's uh, investing in uh, either China or uh, Korea or Japan. Asians, all over the place. And go back to the countries where those people come from. They are the developed countries. It's as simple as that. Government needs to reorientate itself towards how it treats education. It needs to invest much more and focus more on all of these things so that, uh, of course, that will also add tremendously to our development uh, process. Well, but just by way of summary, <coughs> the special advisor to the president on information and strategy, Mr. Bayo Nonoga, said there will be a new date. Now, the exact date we do not know. So government has not abandoned it. So there is hope, okay, as part of the hope agenda. Let's talk about inflation. Nigeria's inflation rate rose to 31.7% in February from the 29.9 percentage points recorded in January 2024. This figure indicates an increase of 1.80 percentage points, the National Bureau of Statistics said in its latest CPI and inflation report released on Friday. This indicates that in February 2024, the rate of increase in the average price level was more than the rate of increase in the average price level in January 2024. Well, uh, Professor Urao, let me come back to you again. The part of it that I find uh, instructive is that uh, food inflation has gone up to 37.92%. And the food items that are affected, rice, beans, cereals, fish, you know, basic things that people uh, put on the uh, table. So we're finding it difficult to feed. And that is further compounded by energy costs, by transportation costs. I hope a time will not come when even university professors will not be able to feed themselves. Prof. I think we're already there. <laughs> <laughs> we already you there. don't look on that front. <laughs> we already you there. look well fed uh, well, in spite of the inflation. Uh, well, there's, um, we're already there. There's hunger in the land. And I'm, the presidency is aware. I mean, when the president came to Lagos, the clarion call was Ebim Kwawao, and that's how to say, I'm hungry. Everywhere they go to, they, you know, welcome, we are hungry. When the first lady went to Kano, after the greeting, the next thing is, I hope you are aware we are hungry. So the issue of hunger in the land is clear. Let me just make you laugh. 
As I just as I was driving in, uh, somebody is in the market trying to buy Gary. The money is not enough. I just transferred ten thousand to that person to be able to make up the money she took to the market to be able to buy the Gary. So it, it's I not, think I know this somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I have an idea. It could be anybody. <laughs> right? So, but the point I'm making is that it is real. It is not. Uh, we are not just quoting figures. I mean, when the person went last, the, the amount the person took there, I mean, it just added some amount, thinking that that would be adequate, but it's not. The thing has gone up to high heavens. So it is, it is real. Um, and government really needs to, it's something government needs to focus on very seriously. The idea of uh, sharing some food items here and there that government is doing well, um, at least some people will get some things to eat from it. But beyond that, something has to be done about this. And you know, we, we talked about this the other time that it is not uh, really paradoxical that we are talking about not being able to feed ourselves in Nigeria with all the arable land we have. Security is one of those things we, we, we admit. But apart from security, our people see simply do uh, subsistence farming where people have gone, you know, mechanized. You know, how many mechanized farms do we have across the country? And why has government not? You know, paid attention. So that over, not this government. I mean, we are, we are only saying that it's not too late to start. Over the years until now. Uh, so it is real. There is hunger in the land. And uh, it's something that government must put at the top of its agenda. When people are not well fed, of course, uh, there's, there's a theory. Frustration, anger, aggression. When people cannot get their basics. Um, one one uh, uh, writer says, this needs are ontological are non-negotiable, when people cannot feed themselves, those basic things. And uh, uh, the government must put this at the top of its uh, activities to ensure that uh, uh, things are done such that at least people can meet their basics, even without talking about uh, those ones that we can call luxury. Okay, Dr. Biari, um, was the way forward. Yes. Next uh, MPC meeting, yes. there should be further tightening. Uh, no, no, <laughs> That's no, what most no, economists would say. I, th I think we need to prefer credible solutions, and it's very simple. The two critical factors that have affected food prices in the market are the issue of insecurity that have denied farmers from going to the farm and the issue of energy cost, which has actually tripled over the last eight months. And we need to tackle it. And how do we tackle it? We need to get our farmers back to farm, not just back to farm, back to large scale production. And we need to provide security to provide, protect them all the way. And how do we provide security? I have made this suggestion on what we can do. Currently, security is very indigenous. Our military men are overstretched. Mr. President promised us 50 million youths in the army. 50 million is too much. I have made this suggestion. It's very simple. Every community knows those who are the bad, the good, and the ugly. Let the community select 100 of their sons in every of the electoral wards in Nigeria. It's going to serve two purposes. They are going to provide security for the clusters of agri parks that we are going to be developing in every ward in Nigeria. They are also going to help us to secure every inch of Nigeria. Military will take this use. They are part of the military. They can call them the military agro rangers. They can call them whatever. But they are part of the military. Trained, properly equipped. We've run the numbers. It will not take us anything more than three trillion to do this. But the most monies will be returned and repaid, even through the complexes that will be established. Posted back to their communities to enable farmers. Then I saw what the federal government did. There was a proposal we sent on how we can mechanize agriculture. Set up clusters of mechanized agriculture. We are in every of the electoral wards have the usual bulldozers. There was some Chinese I was talking to. Their cost of their bulldozers actually half of what they would do will get from the UK or Germany. And it's equally powerful because that's what they use in their own agri complex. Get the basic bulldozers that will help clear the land. Get the basic tractors, very cheap tractors from the same Chinese. In every world, it's not, it's not like what the Federal Minister of Agriculture, uh, Minister for Agriculture is trying to do. If you import 10,000 tractors under the public sector arrangement, it will be destroyed. Get people to bid for it. The monies will be borrowed $1.1 billion through the Nigerian Sovereign Wealth Investment Authority, who will provide guarantees. Those people, selected bidders, qualifying Nigerians that can make those clusters, let them take those equipment and pay over seven years. Farmers will borrow it. In every of the electoral wars, we can be able to develop at least 3,000 acres of new upstream farm gates and set up clusters suppressing um, this thing. For example, rice. Rice is something that can be done in six months. It's not a one-year crop. If we decide today to do one million clusters of rice uh, paddy, uh, rice um, upstream, the gary species in Egypt, by the end of the next five months, we'll be harvesting nothing less than 12 million paddy rice. 
we will process enough rice. We'll, I ran the numbers. If we do even 500,000 hectares of the Gary species, that does about six tons per yield, in the, and set up cottage factories to process them, in the next six months, we will produce 31.5 million 50 kg bag of rice. That will be sold at 13 naira, and yet the, the, those that are doing it will make profit. It would cost about 305 billion naira to do it, and annually you have about 945 billion naira from that market alone. In the revenues, even at 13 naira per 50 kg bag. The governors have to do this. It's not the presidency that will do this because the land still belongs to the governors. So provide security. Provide the clusters, provide the mechanized arrangement under a private public partnership arrangement, not a public sector driven thing. The other day, they gave 100 billion naira for people to go and buy fertilizer. It is not going to work. You have, Aki Addition did it. They are every farmer registered and they are, we are wallets. That right to them are not true ministries. So we need to do this thing and fix this land. Inflation will come down when we tackle the source of those inflation. Insecurity, lack of production, and we can do that using these simple solutions. <clears throat> okay, let's take one more topic. President Bola Tinubu on Wednesday directed the opening of Nigeria's land and air borders with the Niger Republic, as well as the lifting of various sanctions against the country with immediate effect. A statement from Special Advisor to the President, Ajuri Ingelale, noted that President Tinubu's directive was in compliance with the decisions of the ECOWAS Authority of Heads of State and Government at its extraordinary summit on February 24, 2024, in Abuja. During that summit, ECOWAS leaders had, among other things, agreed to lift economic sanctions against Niger Republic, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Guinea. The Nigerian leader also directed the lifting of suspension on all commercial and financial transactions between Nigeria and Niger, as well as the defreezing of all service transactions, including utility services and electricity to Niger Republic. Well, this is again right down your alley, uh, Professor Awurawo. But I saw a, a report, you know, I think in Daily Trust newspaper, indicating that whereas Nigeria has opened its own borders, that Niger Republic has not yet opened the borders along the 1,600 uh, uh, square kilometers of borderline, uh, you know, that we share. And that in states like Kebi, Katsina, mm -hmm. Jigawa, you know, and also uh, uh, Jibia in Katsina. The borders are still closed on the Niger side. And what our people are told is that where is the Nigerian government that has opened the border, that the government of Niger has not said anything. What exactly are we dealing with? I'm sure those uh, details will be sorted out and uh, the Nigerian authorities will open their own side of the border. Um, because what ECOWAS has done was what this country is desired from the beginning. And they didn't want sanctions from ECOWAS, but ECOWAS had to do what it did. In fact, the region of ECOWAS is really tricky. It's like between the devil and the deep blue sea. Because uh, uh, lifting the, the sanctions is, is like uh, encouraging coups in future. That if people plug coups and take over government, there will be no consequences. But ECOWAS had to tread the, you know, the delicate uh, uh, fine line uh, between not getting ECOWAS to split on the one hand and um, enforcing or trying to encourage democratic governance and, you know, on the other. But ECOWAS opted for the latter, and now the sanctions have been lifted. You know, on, on account of that, Nigeria has uh, uh, opened its own side of the I think uh, the Nigerian authorities will do that. Uh, they had desired that electricity will be restored because in the aftermath of the coup and the cutting off of uh, the electricity from Nigeria, 70% of the country was in darkness. Now that also has been sorted. There is no uh, rational leader who will have all of these uh, benefits from the uh, lifting of the sanction that will not you know, reciprocate. In any case, uh, Nigerians who are affected, in fact, they are affected more by the, by the closure than even Nigerians. So if the Nigerian side has opened, we are showing that they will be able to negotiate and sort, and sort all of that out. But it's a good thing, but we hope that uh, these leaders, because they are trying to form a league, they are still maintaining their hard line. For instance, Niger just uh, a day or two ago has ordered the Americans to, you know, military to leave the country. So they are still maintaining their very tough and hard line. Uh, but we hope that they will begin to soften uh, moving forward, seeing that uh, others are trying to embrace them. And in addition to that, 
uh, you know, ensure that they work with ECOWAS to, to, to enable their people to enjoy development. Because at the end of the day, the people have become far worse in their, you know, uh, their living standards since those sanctions were imposed by ECOWAS a few months ago. Dr. Biari. Uh, the Nigerians, I want to believe, are trying to behave like an ex that was, you know, chased out of a relationship and now the, the husbands are going back to beg them to come back. So you can see, <laughs> but it's in their best interest to actually um, embrace the olive, um, this thing that has been extended by ECOWAS that have lifted the sanction. You know, West Africa is actually better united together you know, under the act for framework. I expect that over time, reason will prevail and they will open their own side of the border to allow at least the, the, the people that share communal relationship within those borders. They are brothers and sisters separated by the related line by the colonialists. So it will not stop them from doing what is right. I'm, I believe that they will open their own side of the, of the border. So finally, let's go to Senegal. Senegal's opposition leader, Usman Sunko, and presidential candidate Bashiru Diomaye Faye have been released from prison, meeting jubilant supporters in Dakar. Their release follows an amnesty by President Macky Sall. Faye, a candidate in the upcoming elections, is expected to start campaigning. Despite his imprisonment, Faye is considered a favorite. Thousands of su supporters massed in Dakar, the capital, to celebrate the news, chanting Sonko's name on the gridlock street where he lives. Some lit flares, dance, or tooted their motorbike and car horns. Sonko, a prominent opposition figure, was jailed last year on what he called false charges to prevent him from running. Despite the amnesty, Sonko will not contest the elections. Now, Senegal goes to the polls March 24. 19 presidential candidates, one of whom is a woman, 7.033 million uh, voters out of a population of uh, 18 uh, million. And already, ECOWAS has sent an observer mission led by Nigeria's Professor Ibrahim Gambari. The concern of the international community is that you know, the uh, process will be free and fair. And that by April 2, Macky Sall will vacate the office as uh, the Constitution stipulates and as upheld by the Constitutional Court. Professor Aurao. Briefly. Well, well uh, what is happening uh, in Senegal is, uh, is good. Uh, again, when we talk about the rule of law, uh, the Constitutional Court helped to clear all the mess, you know. Everything was like in a state of flux up to that ruling. That ruling cleared the way and paved the way for uh, where we are now. And the release of these uh, uh, political prisoners is also good. I mean, it's, it's in the right direction even though some of them will not be able to you know, uh, uh, contest in the election anymore, it's too, it's too close. Uh, some others you know, will. Um, the tension that gripped the country you know, has now gone down. Um, you know, uh, and of course, when a new government comes uh, early April and uh, 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 Makisa leaves, hopefully there will be stability in, uh, in Senegal. If that uh, plot to uh, perpetuate himself in office up to December or even longer had been there. The country would have been plunged into uh, crisis and, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of the stablest countries in West Africa up to now would have been plunged into crisis. So we are happy that uh, things are in the right direction. The rule of law has come to prevail and uh, we can only wish uh, the Senegalese uh, all the best. Doctor? There is nothing like free, fair and credible elections. And it's good that um, uh, Makisal is going ahead with the election. But again, Sanko should be allowed to contest. You know, this issue of trying to deny... His party, Pastev, had been dissolved. Exactly. So it's last year. This issue of trying to deny opposition the opportunity of contesting, it's not appropriate for a democracy. Look at what happened in America. They tried everything to deny Trump from being on the ballot. The US Supreme Court ruled 9 over 0 that he should be allowed, 9 to 0 that he should be allowed to be on the ballot. Let the people decide through the ballot who they want to be their leader. You, all this political shenanigans in Africa should stop. Why we have military incursions in some of these West African states is because of the same issue of lack of rule of law and all those stuff. Yeah, do I enshrined it when he was president. And it's good for people to go out there, contest, say your manifesto, say your programs, and let the people decide who will be their ruler. 
Well, thank you very much, Dr. Obiariri, and thank you very much, Professor Awurawo. You've been watching This Day Live, the Sunday talk show, here on Arise News. I'm Ruben Abati. From my entire team here in Lagos, bye for now, and thank you very much for watching. Thank you.